بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Insha'Allah the topic for tonight will be revolving around the significant figure and the greatest companion arguably on the 10th of Muharram which we need to learn from his stances in which we need to learn from his wording his knowledge his application and his ma'rifah in the Ahl al-Bayt and in the concept of Imam but before we start by analyzing Abu Fadl al-Abbas on this important night we first need to analyze the importance of Karbala and how it applies first and foremost to our everyday perspective. How can we through Karbala be Imam Hussein or through Karbala be on the opposite side and be a Shimmer? So inshallah we will start off by looking at the importance of Karbala. Then looking at the importance of knowing our Imam through Karbala and on the third perspective after we've accomplished by looking at the first two points we'll begin to analyze in more depth the wording of Abu Fadl al-Abbas on the 10th of Muharram and its effect on our daily lives so inshallah to start the topic please help me in reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad now we're looking on the internet I came across a particular aspect which I didn't think I'd actually come across it because it was a Turkish series but it had a title by the name saying the importance of Karbala so I thought let me click on it let me see what they actually say we might actually learn something and Imam Ali teaches us take wise words even if it's on the tongue of a fool so I thought to myself let's click on this particular clip on YouTube let's see what they say and you find two mafia warlords if they if that's we can name them that are sitting behind two different desks one of which is a brutal figure that brutal figure doesn't read doesn't write he is kind of an assassin all he can do is kill and shoot and uh, decapitate people so he's the brutal guy and the other person is the the mastermind behind the desk so the mastermind asks the brute he's saying do you read and he says reading what do i need to read I know my particular expertise and I do it quite well. Why is it that I need to read? He says, have you ever read a book? He says, once I read a book, but I got really angry and I tore that book apart. So the mafia, let's say the brain behind the desks, asks him, what was the book that you read? And why is it that it made you angry? So the brutes replies by saying that I read a book that was entitled the tragedy of Karbala. So the mastermind tells him, why is it that you were angry? He says, I couldn't comprehend. There was a person that was the grandson of the Prophet. After the Prophet dies, people that call themselves Muslims that believe in his grandfather went and killed him. So I got angry because if I was there, I wouldn't have let them kill this particular grandson. Meanwhile, he didn't even know the person's name. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't know any aspect to do with Karbala. He said, I just read a book. I got angry and I tore it apart. Now the mastermind looks at him. And look at the reply of this person that gives us an analogy. He looks at the brute and he tells him, he says, that book is my favorite. And the brute tells him, why is it your favorite? I, I couldn't stand reading it. And he says, when I read this book, I like to apply it to my life on a daily perspective. And he asks him how. He says, I put myself in that position. I say to myself, if that battle occurred, there's obviously a side which is right 
and a side which was wrong, a side which was on the path of the prophets, and a side that opposed it. They couldn't necessarily both be on the same side, both be on the right. A killer and the person that's being killed can't both go towards heaven. So he says, in that instance, when I read this book, I say to myself, look at my sins. I want to look at my deeds. I want to look at my ethics. I want to look at my daily actions. And I want to say to myself, if Karbala was to happen today, based on my actions, based on my knowledge, based on what I do on as a daily routine, based on who I take as role models, who I look up to, and who I look away from. I try to put myself in the balance. Would I be on the side of Hussein, or would I be on the opposition side? Look at the important lesson that that little five minute clip teaches us. If every day we know to ourselves, just like death, when we remember death, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ And remind them of the days of Allah. One of the days that's mentioned by Imam al-Baqir is the day of death. Now why is it that you have to remember death? The opinion comes forth and states, well just like you're remembering death, when the Prophet states, every salah that you go towards, pray like it's your last prayer. Why? Because when you, know, when you know that you're about to die in the next moment, or this is the last prayer for you, what kind of prayer will that be? I want you to, uh, to imagine or envision what kind of prayer would that be? Slow prayer. The wudu takes half an hour, not two seconds. Every sujood, you actually think about the words and contemplate over the words in which you're saying. You're crying within salah, seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the same aspect, if it was our last salah, we perform that salah in that manner. In the same manner that we say, look at our sins, look at our actions, look at our role models, look at our friends, look at our mannerisms with our parents, with Allah, with the Ahlul Bayt, and importantly, let's look at our actions and how the Imam Sahib al Asr al Zaman views us. That's the first aspect I want to look at from tonight. Now, how is it that we can apply this? How is it that we can analyze that we're going on this path? Let's wake up from this and let's go to the path of Ahlul Bayt. Because some people come, and I've mentioned this before, some people come and say, you know what, the most important aspect when you want to become more religious or when you want to follow your Imams is to have knowledge. Is to have what? Knowledge. Now the opinion comes, yes, to gain knowledge is a very important aspect within religion. And the Ahlul Bayt always stress on the fact that you should always elevate yourself in the aspect of knowledge. The Prophet has numerous ahadith stating that yes, knowledge is a vital and pivotal point within our religion. As in when he comes forth with statements such as, make sure that you learn from the cradle to the grave, or seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. And he says in other traditions, seek knowledge even if you have to go as far as going towards China at the time. And many others in which he says that gain knowledge at a young age rather than an old age because it will stick. Where the later you learn knowledge, the less it will stick within your soul. And there's many other traditions. But someone may come forth and say that knowledge is the most important aspect and nothing else whenever you want to follow the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt. Now the example we want to give is the example of Shimur. It's going to be a very powerful example. But you need a powerful example to make you remember. That's why the powerful calamity of Karbala is remembered till tonight. Because of the effect it has on the hearts. Now look at this example and it will tell you that knowledge will never be enough. You need application. When we look at Shimr ibn al Joshan, can someone come and say that he never had knowledge of Ahlul Bayt? 
Can anyone come forth and state that Shimr ibn al Joshan didn't know who Imam Hussein was? Can someone come and say that he doesn't know the status, that he was an Imam, that the Prophet had numerous ahadith stating the importance of this man? The Quran, numerous verses were revealed about this particular person that he goes and kills. Now, when we look at the life of Shimr ibn al Joshan, as we know in traditions, many people, even though the Imam was showered, his body was showered, narration said there was not a place on his body except there was an arrow or a jurah. Imagine that, brothers and sisters. Imagine the body of your Imam in that state. Many people went to kill the Imam. Many people. But they will come back crying because they could not imagine killing the Imam because every time they go towards him they say the light from his face and he was uttering the words of the Quran we couldn't come close towards this person except who? Shimr ibn al Joshan. when we look at our traditions when Imam Zain al-Abidin states in his khutbah that I am the son of the man that's been beheaded from the back of his head not the front and it's a severe torture from the back rather than the front why is it do you think that he was hit from the back 12 times by Shumr ibn al-Joshan traditions tell us that Shumr ibn al-Joshan la'natullahi alayh when he sat on the chest of Aba Abdullah he couldn't handle looking at the face of Aba Abdullah what does he do he begins crying. And that's why in tradition says he took him and laid him in a manner which he doesn't look at his face. And the coward begins to strike the imam from the back of his head because he could not handle the fact looking at the beauty of the imam's face. Put that in your perspective, in your imagination. I want you to picture this before we get into the detail and the gist of it. So Shimr ibn al-Joshan cries for Imam Hussein. Does that mean he knows who this person is or doesn't know? When he takes the head of Aba Abdullah towards the courtroom of Awaidullah ibn Ziyad, what's the verses that he states? What's the poem that we know till today that he stated about Imam Hussein? When he puts Imam Hussein's head in front of that la'in. In Kufa, and he says, Imla Rikabi Fazlatan, O Dahaba, Inni Katel to Sayyidel Muhajaba, Katel to Khairan Nas, Oman, whatever. Meaning, Shimra bin al Joshan knew exactly what he was doing. He had knowledge of this man. He knew exactly who Imam Hussein was and the death of him, what it would incur. Therefore, when someone brings the argument stating that knowledge is enough, we say no. Many people had knowledge, but many people never used that knowledge in the right manner. And that's why we have to look at the example of Abu Fadl al Abbas on the 10th of Muharram and see what type of knowledge did he have. How can we learn from the knowledge of Abu Fadl al Abbas? Because there's many instances we don't actually look and contemplate over that which he says. We say it, yes, when they cut off his right hand, he says a phrase. When they cut off his left hand, he says a phrase. When he goes towards the water, and the coolness of the water is in his hand in the hot desert. After a raging battle, he also says a verse. Do we contemplate on that which the imam's brother says, or don't we? Because if we do, we will analyze this knowledge and the depth of the knowledge of Abu Fadl al-Abbas and how much he had application in the path of Ahl al-Bayt. The first instance, we know knowledge is not enough. We know that knowledge can always be hindered in the aspect when worldly desires come forth. As in, I may have knowledge and the Sheikh stated it so beautifully yesterday. Someone can be of the greatest caliber and the most honorable caliber. But when it comes to a bank balance and he's offered particular aspects, he says, well, the religion that I'm on is not necessarily the best of religions. 
I will go after the religion which promises me A, B, C, and D. And that's why the, as we want to relate to him as the main general on the 10th of Muharram, Omar ibn Sa'ad, when he was going out, when he received the letter from Yazid stating, because he was questioning it, should I go and kill the grandson of the Prophet of Islam, the religion that we believe in, the person that the Prophet states is one of two. Sayyidai Shabab Ahlil Jannah. I'm going to kill someone that the Prophet states about him. He will be the guardian of the youth of paradise. He will be that person. So I'm going to kill him and I'm thinking I'm going to go towards heaven. And that's the irony of the groups nowadays we see overseas. I just want to get or mention filth on the pulpits. So going back to the topic, meaning Amr ibn Sa'ad, he also had knowledge. However, when Yazid brings forth a letter saying, you know what, we'll give you that which we want. Amr ibn Sa'ad wanted what? What did you mention on the second night? Amr ibn Sa'ad, all he ever dreamed about is having the governorship of Persia. In the Arabic linguistics, we call it Hukmur Ray, the governorship of Persia. At the time, Persia was not what we have Persia today. It was, li it was much larger. It encompassed neighboring countries now. So when he opens the letter, he's still questioning, remember, should I or should I not go towards killing, Aba, uh, killing Imam Hussein? And then he, in his own mind, begins to doubt it. And wanting the world rather than the hereafter, he says to himself, what did we say? He says, Should I leave this governorship? And this governorship is that and all that which I desire. Or do I come back with the bloodstains of Hussein on my hands? Then he begins to question it further. What does he say? They say that Allah has created a heaven and a hell. If they are truthful in what they say. They have doubt in religion altogether by that which he says. I'll take two years of my time in which I will repent towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will forgive me. So we see on the second level, knowledge, even though he may have application, may not, but surely in this instance he does not, he may be eluded by worldly desires. So how is it that we can stand firm? What examples do we have? I have a massive banner right behind me, telling you exactly who to look at when you want to look at application, knowledge and ma'rifah of the Ahl al-Bayt. Because when we look at the importance of Karbala, we want to look at the importance on the 21st century perspective, isn't it? It's not enough learning history, learning history, learning history. How can I apply history to, to my here and now? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. How can I apply Karbala here in Sydney? People ask themselves this in all our Imam's times. Imam al kadhim you think he didn't have Shia? He had Shia. Do you know how many... Do you know the number of people that used to go towards Imam Hussein's shrine and visit Imam Hussein's shrine in the time of Imam al kadhim Hundreds if not thousands would go towards Imam Hussein. But the Hussein of the time, which was Imam al kadhim was in prison. Two guards. The Shia all go towards Imam Hussein. Yes, it's important. But the Hussein of the time is where? In prison. Two guards. You think the Shia can't take him out? And that's why when we apply it to a 21st century basis, we all remember Imam Hussein. It's an of the utmost importance. Even Imam Sahib al Asri was Zaman. And stated in Ziyarat Nahya, he cries instead of tears, blood for Imam Hussein. So he's also mourning. However, the Hussein of our time is Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. And just like we remember the companions of Imam Hussein, 
You have to remember the companions of Imam Mahdi may be sitting right here right now. But the Imam is still waiting for you to come towards him. For you to take that step, that initiative to repent first and foremost. Cleanse yourself through the tears for Abu Abdullah and go towards the message. Go towards becoming a companion of the Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman So that's the second level. The third level, what can we learn? Knowledge is not enough. We need application. Secondly, we know that we need application on a 21st century basis because we need to become the best companions for our Imam. So who can we look at to benefit from? And there's one aspect that many people overlook when looking at the life of Abu Fadl al-Abbas. Because we, whenever we do... Or when we talk about our Fadl Abbas, we do great injustice to this great figure. Because we only mention him, he was a brave warrior. He was a brave warrior. He was a brave warrior. Not once have we contemplated on the knowledge of this person. Of the akhlaq of this person. The morality. The aspect in which he had. From Ali ibn Abi Talib. People always look at Abu Fadl Abbas. His mother is Umm al -Banin. And yes, without a shadow of doubt. One of the greatest ladies ever to be mentioned in the religion of Islam. But people always put a blind eye to the fact that Abu Fadl al-Abbas's father was Ali ibn Abi Talib. When we look at the knowledge that's passed down, there's one aspect that people always overlook. When the Imam was fought in Mecca, Abu Fadl al-Abbas has a stance in Mecca to make you know what kind of knowledge this person had and how much ma'rifah he had about the Ahl al-Bayt. He gets up and he first and foremost states, he says, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That first and foremost, he says, blessed this. And he points at the Holy Kaaba. Blessed this with what? He says, blessed this with the birth of that person's father. Pointing at who? Imam Hussein. Then he says, O oh, disbelievers and infidels. O oh, disbelievers and infidels. Do you take the Imam away from the Holy Kaaba? Knowing very well that he has more authority than yourselves. When it comes towards the Kaaba, he says, if it wasn't for Allah's divine wisdom, mercy, and secret, while everyone goes towards the Kaaba, the Kaaba would have lifted and gone towards the Imam. For everyone wants to come and touch the Kaaba, but the Kaaba, all it wants to do is touch the hands of the Imam. And what does he say? He says, if it wasn't for the fact that the Imam's will is in unison with that will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I would have attacked you like an angry eagle attacks a sparrow in midair. Then he says, do you threaten, when they talked about the Imam, do you threaten a person that plays with death in his childhood, what do you think he will become in his adulthood? He says, you are doing the same mistake that Quraysh did when they went and seek to kill the Prophet of Islam. And likewise, you are going and attempting to kill the son of his daughter. Look what he says. He says, just like they could never touch the Prophet of Islam when Ali ibn Abi Talib was alive. You will never get close to Imam Hussein when there is still a breath in me. And I think just for that statement, we need to raise our voices in a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. He says, look. He continues, he says, look. 
when you analyze, he says, look at the person that's in his household. Wine is being drunk. And in whose household owns the kawthar on the day of judgment. Look at in whose houses there are dances. And look at whose houses there's verses of the Holy Quran revealed. Look at whose houses has impurity. And look at whose houses has purity. So he gives us an example to go by. Knowledge upon knowledge upon knowledge. Tells everyone there and then. Of his wisdom and his ma'rifah of the imam. Now. What can we learn from this speech? Because there's many aspects we can look at. Many, many aspects. But due to the time limitations, we can only look at one aspect right now. At three prepareds. But one of the aspects, when he teaches us, when he says, make sure that you look at in whose houses has A, B, C, and D. And whose houses has purity. We find ourselves caught up in the aspect of wilaya and why? Because Abu Fadl Abbas could have easily said, look at the Imam first, then look at Yazid. No. Afur Adin states, before we have Wilayah, we have the concept of Bara'a. Because on the first level, Allah is trying to teach us, make sure that you dissociate yourself first and foremost from anything against the religion. Anyone against the Ahlul Bayt, anyone against Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. 